And Elizabeth is just coming on. Oh, oh, great, yeah. I'll wait for a moment till she gets on. Yeah, she said she might be a minute late, but she got here pretty quickly. There she is. Okay, well, welcome to this hearing of the Local Historic District Commission. Uh, the purpose of our commission is to aid property owners and the town in preserving and protecting the distinctive characteristics and architecture of buildings and places significant in the history of Amherst. And today's agenda is pretty central to uh, that goal. Um, so we wanna start by welcoming our newest member, Elizabeth Sharp. Uh, welcome to the commission. Um, and do you know everybody here now? I do. Okay. Uh, I do. Yes, it was great to meet everybody the other day. That was perfect because we met in person. Thank you all. It's the first time a lot of us met in person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, well, the first thing, the second thing on our agenda is to discuss East Amherst as a potential historic district, which was the purpose of our meeting on Monday um, when we did a site visit. And so I want to open up that conversation. Steve? You're muted. You're muted, Steve. Uh, somebody create a new story. Hello? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. now you can hear me. oh I think we should pursue it. Um, don't you guys? Based on what we saw? I agree. Okay. I thought it was lovely walking around. I was surprised how many beautiful historic buildings there were. I'm sorry there's a street that goes so fast through the area, but um, we can only work with where we are now. So I thought it uh, made sense. It uh, appeared to be uh, still cohesive you can still get the sense of East Village, as it was called, um, both the commercial aspects and the residential aspects um, from the 18th century through the um, early to mid 19th century. So I thought it it seemed logical. It had it had a logical cohesion today that it that it had then. I, I agree. I think it uh, what we saw was quite interesting. And there's still a great deal there that looks uh, quite historic and worth preserving. Bruce, I you look like you're getting ready to say something. Bruce? Um, I agree. Uh, I, I, it is um, unfortunate in some respects that there's a road that goes through, but the road uh is a common or at least historically it's uh it it, it broadens in the uh in in on one side to be uh the common um and there are more historic buildings there of course than you realize driving past because uh they many of them have been clad in various ways that that have cover that cover up a lot of the uh, his, historic detailing but but covering up is probably operative because it means it's still there uh, in some ways it's protected so uh, uh it's not evident as much you look uh you know you, you when you when you're walking you see the foundations and you see this building that looks new and then you see that it's got a solid stone foundation that's you know pushing 200 years old um that's kind of uh um <laughs> It, it um it, it's it's impressive when you see things like that particularly when you weren't expecting it but as we were walking uh with the sole purpose of seeing things like that um it was interesting to find that they were there um uh, not everywhere but uh, and some of the uh, those buildings are portions of them are old and they've been uh, biggerized and some of them have not just been biggerized but they've also been buggerized if you can use that term probably not um in other words they're uh, they're not um they haven't been cherished in quite the same way but uh but the proposal that we're considering would uh increase the chances that uh owners might if they knew what they had uh, be encouraged to uh um move towards um 
um, revealing some of the more uh, historically pertinent parts of their buildings. So it's an interesting, uh, and we only half walked, so we've got the other, we've got uh, uh, as many again buildings, uh, which we presumably will have similar findings. So it's it's definitely a, an area that's uh, got a um, uh, quite a bundle of uh, old properties in it. And I think it's significant that the National Registry has, you know, been established with these buildings and things. It's not, um, it didn't sound to me like we are kind of bringing in anything new, any new buildings, um, just branching off of, or building off of what the is already um, documented from the National Registry. I was surprised by how many buildings were like well kept and had owner and were owner occupied you just don't even really realize it like the that one dickinson building and and, it, and if we did it it's a pretty adjacent to the dickinson uh, lhd and i think maybe would elevate that area so i i'm very enthusiastic about it Could I ask a, a question? So it's been a, a, a while since I've done this. Um, Nate, could you just review the um, the process, the length of time, you know, the timetable, like how does this, how would this take place? Yeah, I mean, I think we'd have to um, have another site visit or two to establish possible boundaries. And then, mm -hmm. you know, every property needs to be inventoried. And so, you know, based on the existing um and proposed national register districts that's probably already occurred we may need to update the existing forms um you know there's a study committee that's formed so the this commission can either act as the study committee or recommend that a study committee be formed that would do this work and so um you know mass historic says it could take up to a year from initial research to adoption it could be faster depending on you know, how fast the research can get done. You know, you'd have to do a survey of the residents, um, hold some public hearings, write a preliminary study report that's reviewed by Mass Historic, and then uh, write a final report after certain steps. I mean, I, you know, it could be eight, eight to 12 months. Lincoln Sunset took over three years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. It, but that was a big I, one. Yeah, it was a big one. I mean, and also sometimes, you know, we could, the, uh, for instance, um, Mass Historic just wrote back about actually one of the districts we were talking about trying to expand and they really do want all these updated inventory forms and photographs <laughs> and things. And so they, um, you know, so I think maybe half the properties or more than half in East Amherst, although they were inventoried, you know, we'd have to redo the forms and probably update the bibliography and research. Um, so we could get, you know, say that takes a few months and then we'd submit a preliminary study report to Mass Historic, I've heard that they are pretty busy. And so and it could be that the study report stays with Mass Historic for a month or two before they provide comments. And so, you know, there's just points in the process where it, you know, it takes some time. Um, but yeah, I, I think the only other comment I was going to make is, um, you know, we're trying, the town's trying to put out a request for a proposal for a consultant to look at downtown design standards. And my hope is that uh, the standards have, um, you know, different building types and things that could then be adapted to fit other village centers. And so, you know, um, not that we need specific design standards or guidelines for each district, but, you know, East Amherst is, it's interesting in that it is mostly residential, you know, uh, the structures are, you know, there's not a lot of say brick or commercial, um, you know, Lincoln Sunset has something similar as well, but varying styles. I feel like in at least the small portion of East Amherst we walked, it was pretty more, it was more consistent in terms of time of development. And, you know, would we want to have any design guidelines or standards that wouldn't necessarily be part of the bylaw, but could be referenced by the bylaw that the commission could use in reviewing that district? And it could, we could, you know, we can have those for any district. Um, and so, you know, that's something that doesn't have to happen at the time of adoption, but it's something we've often discussed about, you know, could we have some other guidance documents as part of a district? So, you know, Elizabeth, your question, I mean, you know, I do think it's probably at least six months, you know, that's a, that's, that'd be quick. 
Um, a two full sort of follow ups to that is one is there money to pay somebody to do this work? You're talking about updating a lot of forms and um, more research and a new bibliography, et cetera. Um, so that's that's a bit of concentrated effort. And then the other question I had is, what is the role of the residents themselves or the owners of those properties? Right. So there's no funding right now. Um, you know, it would be staff time and uh, we could put a request in, say, for CPA funding or some other funding, but not, you know, there's not like a, a the commission doesn't have a, a, you know, dedicated fund or anything for that. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, um, we have Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is under contract. They, you know, they submitted the expansion and within East Amherst, there's the existing forms and there is some existing CPA money that we're trying to get them under contract to update those forms. So they might be doing some of the work anyways, mm -hmm. um, which would be nice under a separate contract and for another purpose, you know, for the National Register mm -hmm. District, but it could serve a local historic district um, as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that can be a lot of work. I mean, I know there's volunteers mm -hmm. in the I community that can help. Um, well, a couple things, last time, uh, I actually digitized most of them. I typed up two a day for over a year. Uh, so that was the labor. And then we did get a CPA grant, uh, grant for $5,000 and we hired a graduate student from UMass who was like terrific. And then in addition to that, we got a bunch of interns from UMass who were not as helpful as a grad student, but very helpful. And, um, but before we even, it kind of feel like we're putting the cart before the horse here because before we can even talk about East Amherst LHD, I think we have to talk about the downtown effort and what we're going to do about that. Because if we do decide to proceed with the downtown business LHD, we're going to be spreading our, this will have to, we'll be spreading ourselves way too thin. So could I, could we table this for just a second until we talk about um, what we're already a little bit down the road on? Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna, I mean, it might be pertinent. Um, you know, the second question was what about property owners? And so, you know, the um, typically during the study process, you'd, you would notify all the property owners in the proposed district with information and have a public hearing and a public meeting with them, inviting them to come and provide feedback. And so, you, you know, there's usually a survey that you provide to property owners in terms of their knowledge of districts, you know, their, their thoughts on them. Uh, in terms of preservation and other things. And so, you know, um, when we first did the um, the first district here, the Dickinson Local Historic District, Mass Historic said, you know, if a majority of property owners are really opposed to it, you know, it may be that you should delay the process and really try to inform them so that they understand it and that there's, you know, say a majority of um, support. It's not necessary, but, you know, I think that as the town, as, you know, town staff and you know, the town has to adopt it, I think we would consider how property owners would um, would react to it. So, I mean, you know, I think that's, there's a balance there, right? So, um, you know, I think that's relevant to the downtown one because really there's only one property owner, maybe two, but really just one property owner owns many of the properties. And so, um, you know, when we we're looking at the Dickinson district, we were thinking of expanding uh, to a lot of Amherst College properties. And so we met with Amherst College and asked them what they thought of, you know, being a local historic district. And so, you know, it it didn't necessarily, you know, I think that is important, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, I, I do think if, if all the property owners say no, then I think, you know, we'd have to consider, okay, why, you know, is there things we can change? You know, do we need design guidelines up front to show them what, you know, could be allowed? So it's not just a no to anything, you know, any change. And so, I mean, those are, I think that's what Mass Historic would probably recommend is just, you know, slow the process down a little bit and, you know, figure out how, how it could be approved. How do you get to yes? Um, oh, I'm sorry to keep, I'm sorry to keep talking. Um, there, Elizabeth, you weren't here before. There actually is a handbook published by the Mass Historical Commission that delineates the actual procedure. So, and there's a form letter that goes out to all the property, prospective property owners. So we'd have to send that out. Then there's a prescribed number of hearings, public hearings that you have to have, at least three, I think. Uh, so there is a deliberate process um, to doing it. 
Sorry, I know, sorry to keep saying. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, we can. Yeah, I can send you the link. It's on. Just send me the link. Thank you. So the next steps, Nate, that makes most sense are to do what? I mean, I, I do think, um, you know, Steve's question about what what area to focus on is important because it is a big process for both. You know, so even if, you know, downtown is a smaller district and work's been done, it's still, there's still a process that needs to happen. So I think, I mean, maybe having that discussion together, um, you know, because I, I do think it's a lot of work and it, you know, because there isn't any money, it is staff or, you know, your time, right? If you wanted to be the study committee for East Amherst and if we'd say, okay, there's, you know, 70 inventory forms that need to be updated, that's a lot of work. Um, you know, I'm just throwing a number out there. And, you know, so I don't, you know, like I said, we're trying to get PVPC under contract but, um, to do some of that, but so, yeah, I don't, I think maybe talking about this, the town center one as well is important. Uh, let's move then to a discussion of the LHD in the town center. I know Steve has done a lot of work and he has a report for us. I, I really haven't done a lot of work, but I did. Uh, Bruce and I did meet with uh, Kurt Shumway a couple weeks ago, and um, I did want to report on that. We presented, um, you know, the we try to be holistic and just be creative and just say if we would support, you know, relaxed zoning for that part, uh, like for instance, four stories instead of three stories, or we showed uh, Kurt um, the, the sketches that Pam Rooney and uh, Susanna Fabing had done. And I know that Kurt's online. Um, Kurt, was, Kurt, you know, was not receptive to it. And, um, uh, you know, he doesn't think that the, the buildings are particularly historic and, um, you know, I get. I don't want to speak. If Kurt's on this um, call, I don't want to speak for Kurt. I mean, Kurt is perfectly capable of speaking for himself. But one thing I did want to say was that during the meeting, Bruce had to go. But he, before Bruce went, um, you know, he he had some reservations about having an LHD on those properties, and he had to go before he could articulate what his objections were. So. Uh, I'd like to throw it over to, to Bruce because I'd like to hear what he has to say. Bruce. Uh, oh, um, uh, I'm resurrecting my thinking here. Um, I was speaking for myself and I was thinking aloud. It was a nice meeting. I felt comfortable uh, in Kurt's presence, even though he was the owner and he'd, he'd made it clear that he either controlled or owned uh, you know, this uh, a, a, a substantial portion of this strip. But it was uh, it was something that's been in the family for a long time. That uh, that he and the family care about it. He's a kind of a family trustee. Uh, he had said, "Well, you know, there are." I could sit on it and it could stay the way it is forever or I mean, I, for a long time, or we could do something else. And he was uh, helping us understand uh, what his thoughts would be as a property owner and, um, and, and also a property owner who is a, a developer or has development inclinations from time to time. So he's, he's, um, so anyway, I was looking at that property and I was thinking about everything that I have uh, thought and said in the six or so years that I've been on this commission about uh, properties. And, uh, and, and I had the feeling that this property, at least the section of the property from Coles Lane down to Halleck, was an unusual situation uh, in that it was all owned by... It, 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 all of the in, so we, we've got lots of we've got a number of smaller parcels, but they are already consolidated. There's a single owner, number one, and number two was, um, it was a, a, a it's a property that, in my view that has been kind of ravaged by the uh, economic pressure that has been exerted by the expansion and in, in the uh, 50 40 years ago the very rapid expansion of UMass um 
so ravaged in that sense that it used to be uh, perhaps you know when my wife was a child here in the late 40s and 50s uh, a kind of a, a residential district but then in the 60s and 70s it it had this force that happened to it that um, changed it in a way and I didn't live here then so this is just what I've heard from being have, have grown up and live with my wife who was born in town uh, you know almost 80 years ago so I and I thought golly maybe this property is one that uh, um, should be uh, um, changed it should be we should try and encourage whoever owns this property to do to, to, to make a building which in 50 or 100 years will be the building of this era that we want to preserve uh, uh, and that responding to these forces that have uh, uh, kind of uh, um, ravaged the, the residential area that it used to be and turned it into a, a fairly um, underdeveloped retail uh, commercial property. And it seemed like, so I was thinking that the, uh, that the, the, the kind of uh, guidance and things that we typically uh, would apply to properties, it, this seemed to be a unique situation in town. And I thought we should, we should as a commission and as a town think uniquely about it. I, I think that's, that, was, that was the, uh, the, the background to my thinking. And so I, I was uh, encouraging, uh, or I was thinking of encouraging, or I was thinking about what would, what would a building that was, uh, uh, that, that that was less respectful of the of the uh, of the buildings that are there now, and more respectful of the force of nature or the force of economic change that's be, that's been driving it for uh, for a few decades. And and what is the uh, what is the response which in uh, a few generations we'd look back on and say, yeah, that's the story of this site includes you know. Uh, uh, it, it tells us it re, it reflects the story of uh, the late half of the 20th century's uh, you know um, impact on this site. Uh, is, does that sound like what I said, Steve? So one of the things you said was that you weren't that you weren't didn't realize that this was the location we were talking about. But let's put that aside for a second. Oh, that's true. I thought we were yeah. coming to the a meeting the, of the west side of Kendrick Park. So I my yeah. mentally i was i was i was differently attuned but but you know I, i'm i'm supposed to be able to make uh, those kind of adjustments without falling on my face it's okay it's okay so anyway I, I i don't know if nate has it online for us to see but i uh, uh typed up a inventory of the actual properties that are owned by um mr shumway it's actually six properties one of them i guess is under option is actually owned by Barry Roberts, um, but Kurt has uh, the first right of refusal for it. And I also put up the photographs of each of the properties, if you got, so we can know what we're discussing. Nate, yes, I have looked. Thank, that was great. That, I mean, I, I I looked and read everything that was there. Oh, okay. I can't say I've remembered it, but I've got it on another screen, so I can get to it quickly if we need to. Well, I think I sent it to Nate, so I think Nate can pull it up. If can you pull it up, Nate, or? Yeah, there's, I was actually going to just pull lot, up. There's a lot to pull up. I mean, yeah, no, I've actually created a, but this is only like, I put up 12, uh, 10 photographs and then just one inventory. So that's really what I wanted to refer to, just uh -huh. so we could be informed about this. Okay, so, here, so there you oh, go. Yes. That's, um, that's the list of properties. So you see that um, Mr. Shumway owns basically all of the blocks from Coles to Halleck. Uh, and I also tried to put, if you can put the, it's Brugger's Bakery, which, uh, Brugger's Bagels, which I didn't realize was the Shumway ice cream parlor. And it turns out that first click behind uh, the Brugger's, um, Brugger's Bagel uh, was the Shumway uh, dry cleaners. So how about that? So it goes, you know, so like, that also gives me reservations like Bruce. You know, this is a family enterprise, you know, um, but to be, to be 
So when we talk to Kurt, and I hope Kurt jump, jumps in, one of the things we discussed was having it, you know, right now, there's, you could, we have historic, a board that offers recommendations about design, the design review board, I believe. But their recommendations are just that. They have absolutely no, they're not binding. So what we were talking about with Kurt, and he was receptive to, was coming up with design guidelines that are binding. And it seemed like the town, I, and to be honest, I think the town, you know, uh, was also, I think they want to develop this area too, you know. And also, I, uh, Kurt was, after Bruce left, Kurt, I think, wants to put up dorm, you know, you know, housing for students. So, you know, uh, he was showing us sketches and all that kind of stuff. So I was just wondering, I, in my heart of hearts, I have a really, you know, with the Lincoln Sunset LHD, it was a wellspring of people who wanted it. So, um, and I knew the people and I, they're, you know, our neighborhood was at stake and people's nest eggs were at stake and the, their quality of life was at stake. So I really had a fire in my belly to pursue that. This is a case where um, I talked to the Massachusetts Historical Commission and we can, LHDs can be a, imposed on property owners who don't want them. But anyway, I, I just, to be honest, I just don't have the same fervor for trying to impose something, even though this is such a crucial section of our town. So my feeling is if we could get the town, and you, and I'm, I'm sure you people will have a different take on this, to really come up with real design guidelines pronto, you know, not like uh, it takes forever, but actually a binding, I think that would be a win for this town. Um, and I think that Basically, all the research has already been done for us to issue a study report. We could put a, stu a study report together in a matter of a couple months. Uh, it's just, a, you know, the form Bs have been revised. Uh, we'd have to follow the procedure, but that could be done very quickly. So my feeling is using that as kind of like leverage to get the town to move on this. Um, that that's what I'm proposing to do because uh, because if they don't move on this, um, on coming up with design uh, guidelines, they'll prevent more archipelago buildings across the street. Um, uh, then we should pursue this. But I think my feeling, and I hope that people don't think I'm a Benedict Arnold, by you know, my feeling is um, that maybe we should try to pursue the real design guidelines. That have real that are binding uh, before we go down this route, and if that's the case, that would allow us to use our resources to like do East Amherst. I don't think we can do both right now. It's just too much. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> that's a nice speech. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's, I, I, I would love to hear from Kurt Shumway because one thing that alarms me in hearing all this, I, I agree, uh, I think it's really important to have guidelines, to have a nice design there, it's crucial for our town, but what alarms me is why when the town is in so much need of reasons for people to go to downtown. We've lost carried, we've lost so many little shops that bring people downtown. Why court is interested in another student dormitory when I think it's time that the town and the university figure out where this mass of students should live. If we're going to sacrifice the main street of our town, which should be retail and should should be attractive, should be a place that brings people to town to make the town thrive. Why we want to sacrifice one of those really important spots to another student dormitory where nobody except those students are going to want to go. That's I, I would like to hear why this is the first choice. That that would be really important to hear. And I'm open to his uh his assessment. So, and Karen, just so you know, I discussed that at the meeting. I said that our brand is history, and keeping the strip uh, the way it is is part of uh, making uh, destination Amherst. And um, so, 
and I so I, I articulated all these things just so you know that this isn't the first time you've heard okay them. okay thank you right, Nate. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, Kurt's on. He's having trouble uh, with the audio connection. I think he might be on now through phone, but I was going to say, he didn't necessarily say that he was going to build student housing. Um, I think that's a mischaracterization. I mean, he actually said he would design apartments that could be used by by non-students, right? So there's ways you can develop and design interior layouts. And he's, you know, I think he does have the best interest of the town in mind, right? I mean, this is his property. It's his investment. He wants to see it succeed. And so, um, you know, he, he thought the design guidelines were a good first step. And I, so, you know, those would have, um, I, my thought is that they would have regulatory power too, Steve, that they wouldn't be um, advisory, that those would be things the planning board and zoning board would apply to projects in a way that it could be enforceable or be conditions. And so it wouldn't, you know, I think it would actually help with uh, development downtown. And like I said, I'm hoping those design guidelines could then be applied to other village centers uh, through zoning overlays or something. And so I'm, um, yeah, I'm, you know, because going through, we have, you know, some grant money for that. It's a pretty, it's a really big project. So I'm hoping that it becomes more than uh, advisory and it becomes something that is really used to help with uh, development. So, you know, we have a community planning grant from the state that is looking at public right of way. And then we have town funds looking at the architecture of buildings. And so, you know, what I'm hoping is that these design guidelines will say, well, you have a, these are the setbacks you want from curb to building front. You know, here's how much you want for say street trees or amenities or seating. Here's what the setback would be to awnings. Here's the type of architecture and banding we'd want to see or, you know, types of uh, relief or here's, you know, even recommendations on height of buildings or how to screen HVAC and utilities. And it becomes, you know, pretty, a, a really nice um, kind of guidebook that, you know, and, it'll, and, it'll, and it's, it's, you know, it's illustrations and text. It's not formal zoning code, but it's something that is very use, usable and user-friendly for developers, boards and committees and staff. And so, um, and it would have, like I said, some teeth. Um, Kurt does have his hand raised. I was going to just let everyone know that this is being recorded. And, um, you know, I think Kurt, you know, it's a public meeting. So it's not, you know, he's not, if we ask him to speak, he can, but he's, you know, you don't have to, Kurt, if you don't want to. I know the commission, commission members have he asked. He just but... emailed me and he asked to talk. Uh, to okay, me yeah, so that's good. Happens, so, uh, I'd love to have him speak. Hmm. And I, I know there was a hand raised. Maybe it was Kurt, if you wanted to you raise Kurt your hand again. Me. I can allow <laughs> you to talk, Kurt. Um, Oh, is that working now? It is, yes. Yes. Oh. yes. Gosh, I've been. All right. Sorry. So, hold on. Hold on. If you're if you're on your if you're on your cell phone, then there's going to be the echo. No, so no, I you... understand that. I've been trying to reach Steve or anybody because I can't figure out how to turn on the audio. But I guess that you had control of that. You've got the yeah, audio yeah. on now. That makes sense. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. And yes, I I'm aware that this is a public meeting. Um, uh, I think. Uh, Nate characterized it correctly. Um, uh, we had a nice meeting, Steve um, and and Bruce and Nate. I think that it is a mis complete mischaracterization that I plan to build college dorm housing. Um, I think my goal would be to work together with as many people as possible to try to create something special for the town. Uh, there are some really fundamental basics that I've gone over with people. Um, you won't hear me asking for five stories. Um, I know what a no is before you ask. So I, I understand that. Um, I, I think it's important to, be, again, once again, I'm gonna be aware that this is a public uh situation so my my existing tenants who have heard rumblings of redevelopment have all come to me in favor of doing something because they really want a more vibrant frankly i'm i'm looking at this as becoming possibly a destination um some certainly restaurants um potentially coupled with entertainment 
there is no question in where I'm completely open and, it, you know, it, it would be foolish not to think otherwise, is the components of development of this nature in this town are, are the, the backbone is residential. We understand that. If you were to ask me if I was building this specifically for students, like some have uh, suggested other developers have designed their apartments for that purpose, I would say to you that, no, I, it's never even crossed my mind. We will be, I would be building traditional apartments with living rooms and dining rooms. If, you know, we have one bedrooms, two bedrooms and three bedrooms, wherever the mix might be in a healthy component of uh, affordable housing. I would be looking to do setbacks where we have people sitting out front and enjoying enjoying all that. Um, I would try to stay away from flat roofs and doing peaks and dormers and just really, you know, the best way I can tell you is to try to work with people to try to create something that we have, we can be really proud of together. Um, I read, um, some of the notes that were presented about this particular site and one thing that i took sort of to heart was that it was uh described as quote unquote alarming that one owner owns all this stuff i guess i kind of it's hard for me not to take that kind of personal my goal is to do something kind of really uh super awesome for the town working with everybody and to be have it be very special um to say that students won't be living there would be a misrepresentation we know there's a high demand coming from the student population i wouldn't try to tell you otherwise if there are a way for me to to feel comfortable in building something of this magnitude this is big stuff that we're talking about here this is not one little small site I don't want to hodgepodge this. Uh, it's already hodgepodge. I use that as my terminology because there are some aesthetically rather attractive buildings. I'll use what has once been my favorite property in, in all of what we have there is 236 North Pleasant, which used to be the Men's Resource Center, but way back it was River Valley Craft. To me, that was one of the most beautiful buildings in Amherst during Christmas time with the lights and all that. Well, I can tell you, now I own it, so I can say this, it's really a piece of junk. It looks nice on the outside. It's awful inside. It's functionally obsolete. I'm patching the roofs. I'm, I'm, I'm holding it together just long enough to know what to do. And what I mean by that is it needs a significant investment to kind of keep it standing. That's an exaggeration, but I'll just sort of throw that out at you. What I don't want to do is start throwing significant dollars in to rehab these buildings when there's an opportunity to go forward with possibly something more special. Now, that opportunity is in the, in, in the hands of the town. The town has to create zoning that will allow something to happen there. To use the current zoning as an example, if I leveled every building that exists on that proper, on that stretch, not only that faces North Pleasant, but behind those brick apartments, I could not build one additional housing unit than I have now. So there is no way for me to add one apartment. If you go by there, it sounds like you probably have. There's a tremendous amount of open space there, opportunity for infill and things like that, um, but not under the zoning. So the, the, the town's folks know the situation better than even me. They know what they think they would like to have. And if the town wants to get together and create an opportunity for me to do something, that's terrific. If they don't, they will speak and they'll continue to keep it as is and nothing will happen because I can't do anything. So if the town does do something, they kind of know what needs to be done. There are it's it's mathematical. You have to tear a building down. You have to rebuild it. You have the costs. There are there's income that currently exists. It would need to be replaced. There's risk. There's paying new debt. There's a, a, a ton of things that need to be considered. 
to take a building down and replace it to have it make sense to try to even do something. I don't know anybody that wouldn't love me to take down Brugger's, myself included. But that little parcel that you can't build anything on that little parcel. So it needs to be accompanied by other real estate. So for, for your group to take initiative to maybe protect one building versus another is effectively, if there's development going to go on, it becomes in the hodgepodge type of category. Um, so I'll just sort of leave it at that. You can ask me questions. I'll answer as best I can in the forum. Um, but my goal is to do something special with the town. I'd love to work with everybody to do that. I will say I sort of feel like this is sort of an anti-developer type of a movement that I don't think that there's an awful lot of historic stuff going on there. I grew up there, my parents, I know the neighbors. There might be some old buildings that you can create history to, call it the 236 building, but at some point in time, without significant investment, that's just gonna fall down. So it's not a good piece of real estate. So having said that, I'll I'll, I'll sign off. Well, you, ha you have control, Nate, so you can shut me off and join me back in as you want. Well, I think we'll allow you to talk her if there's questions, if, you know, if committee members uh, want to raise hands or ask questions, I guess. Okay. Um, I think Steve had a question. Does oh, Bruce Steve was a, Bruce's hand up was, was hand up before me. I'll, I'll refer to him. Bruce? Okay. Um, uh, this I wanted to say, uh, uh, basically triggered by what Karen, what, what you said, Karen. I just want to make sure that we all understand uh, a, a fairly basic force here that uh, exists that um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the building code in this state uh, requires, it's the accessibility code more primarily, requires a level of access uh, for um, commercial re retail properties that involves uh, elevators. Um, so, uh, unless the building gets to be a, 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 of a certain scale where the investment uh, can uh, support an elevator, and the buildings we're talking about here in town uh, typically are, are below that scale, that's the reason why we are seeing residential uses on second uh, floors and above, because to get a business uh or a retail or anything uh else would require um that kind of access to be provided which, which only an elevator can 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 uh, can can provide so uh whatever might happen on the first floor of these buildings and this is not just applies to kurt and this these probably these buildings it applies to everything in town and and the neighboring towns all the way to the state uh border uh we might see all sorts of retail and, and interesting vitality on the first floor, but but uh, very typically there's a very very powerful force that is uh, driving uh, retail uses on the upper floors of buildings, uh, um, and so we 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 best bear that in mind because otherwise we're acting a bit like a, a kind of a canute sitting on the shore trying to stop the tide from coming in it's beyond our power to do that. Uh, so, so long as we recognize that as a kind of a basic uh, force that uh, the, the building development uh, is constrained by in this state, uh, it'll help us uh, manage our expectations, I think. I just wanted to say that just so that we know uh, and, can, and can operate effectively as a, as a commission. Steve? Oh gosh, I have so many things to say. I don't even know where to get started. You know, I didn't, I don't, I'm sorry if you felt like I mischaracterized um, about student housing because we had a long discussion about it at the time. One of the things, just so you guys have a little bit of history and maybe we're going far flung, but the archipelago buildings across the street, they claim they weren't student housing. And, um, and Kurt's already heard this, so he has to bear with me. And then we looked at the floor plans and the, the rooms were the size of cell, prison cells. There was no master bedrooms no master bedroom bathrooms. In fact, there were no common rooms. And we were like going, wait a minute, who, who in their right mind is a young fancy 
they always say young professional, young family would live, you know, in something like this. And then we actually went on, my wife went online and it was at this, these buildings, I guess one East Pleasant Street was advertised as luxury student housing. So we, you know, you can't blame us for being, you know, and also you have the, you know, a lot of times if a lot of students, students are living in a building, are non-students going to want to live there? So that's kind of why I characterize it. Also, I was alarmed by Kurt at one point was talking about having a rooftop bar on top of the building that he was discussing. So anyway, my apologies, uh, my apologies if I've mischaracterized anything. The other thing is, uh, in terms of letting those properties, you know, I just want to show that we have do have some kind of leverage here. There's something called demolition by neglect. We're one of the few uh, towns that doesn't have it on the books. And right now the historical commission at my instigation is investigating, trying to do it. it, it um, it's basically what Kurt was saying. It's allowing buildings to be demolished by not fixing them up. And most historic towns in our Commonwealth have something to prevent that. So I'm all in favor of us proceeding with that as well. The other thing is, in turn, Kurt was Mr. I can't remember, like Kurt's such a nice guy. I don't want to call him Mr. Shumway. I just want to call him Kurt. I know that he has only the best interests of the town at heart, and his, his family goes back generations here. Um, so I just want to, like, you know, say that. But I don't think there should be any rezoning before there's some sort of binding guide, guidelines. So I hope that the town hears that, um, you know, and I hope the town, if they want. You know, because I get, Nate, to be honest, at the last meeting, and you know, I have nothing but the highest regard for you. You mentioned that the, in, these buildings are kind of junky inside, and I, I totally, you know, uh, I'm so inarticulate, you know, believe you. But um, we've got to have binding guidelines before we can, anything happens to say, you know, if we're going to not pursue an LHD um, before there's any kind of rezoning. And the other thing is, um, you know, just I just want to point out that mixed use uh, has not worked a lot very well. I mean, it looks like the time's coming back a little bit, but a lot of these um, developers, you know, want mixed use, you know, supposedly retail on the ground floor because they don't have to provide parking. Now, if you have retail, you have to provide parking. And if you have 100%, um, you know, residential, you have to provide parking, but you have this loophole of like uh, no park providing no parking if there's mixed use. And now what they're doing is the developers are trying to uh, diminish the amount of floor space on the first floor for mixed use, but still get the benefits of mixed use. So I just wanted to, to, to point that out to you guys. Um, oh my gosh, there's so much more, but I, I know I'm like monopolizing it. So I'll yield for now. Josh Karen. So, uh, you know, I think that's, I'm, I'm very excited about the fact that courts that you want to do some, uh, a destination thing and that you have so much land and that you would work together with the town. I think it's really a great opportunity for the town to sit down with you and say, what do we need to revitalize uh, the town? You know, building, it doesn't, I, I think you can make a signature building and it could be like a Thorns Market. It doesn't have to have res residential upstairs. I actually think a bar on the third floor sounds like a great idea. I keep wanting the, the uh, Bank of America to put uh, an elevator on the side of their house and have an outdoor bar cafe at the top of that and with some greenery. I think, you know, those kinds of things are exciting and we can talk about it. Um, and I agree. If, if we have a really good plan that's going to be a, a signature thing, a destination thing, something that's going to revitalize the town, that's, and we like that plan, that's the time to change the zoning so that it can be done. And I think it's a great opportunity, actually. Uh, Kurt, I think you had to you have your hand, hand up. Am I on? Yeah. Yep. Oh, I'm on. It's a good thing I wasn't saying anything. Um, Karen, we've never met, but I love your enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> once again, Steve, I'm going to try to, uh, I, I, I believe, uh, again, there's some sort of hot topics in town, and I'm going to throw out what I 
think is a little bit of a mischaracterization. I never said a bar. I said a restaurant that had a bar. Okay. And they're very perceived very differently in this town. Okay. Um, so I want to I want to try to make sure I, I I have to step in to say that because it's a public forum because that's not my intention. Um, in fact, what this town needs is um, I love protocol. It's at this point it's an old it's a, a more of an adult type atmosphere. I think this town needs more of that. Um, it would might be my intention to try to do more of that. Um, I don't need a lot of headaches uh, of of booze joints and all that kind of stuff. They can make people a lot of money. That's not what I'm interested in. It, uh, you know, oops, excuse me, I got to turn off my phone here. Um, what what I will say when you, your comments about retail, let me let me kind of tell you from a developer's perspective, and certainly and clearly 100% mine. Um, I don't think anybody here. Uh, disagrees with the economy right now in the very high risk state of retail and commercial. Uh, look at Northampton and look at our own uh, streets. Um, I have absolutely no problem putting retail on the first floor. It's very appropriate. It's part of the character. I will tell you that when that there are fundamental decisions in going in this type of a project for for me, I suspect any other reasonable developer would consider the same is. I need to be able to build enough density as far as residential units to be able to pay the bills and make it make sense. No one in their right mind would put this type of, and, and by the way, Karen, you mentioned one building. There could be as many as four buildings on this entire project. It could be massive. It's not, we're not talking about one building. It's, it, it, it could be done lots of different ways. Again, um, and, and, it's a big piece of dirt. You can do a lot there, uh, which is really exciting if you go into it with that approach. But I think it's important to know that the density is very, very important as far as being able to support the financial aspect of a project of this nature or, or several buildings. Uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of people downtown. Uh, many of them are still recovering from COVID. Some aren't paying rent, some are, some are paying half rent. We don't really know. I know my tenants and where they stand, and I'm still helping them through uh, COVID. So I am not, I would not proceed with the project if I had to rely on leasing and collecting rent from retail. It's just too risky. Now it can be done if we get and, I, and I've kind of talked, and again, this comes to the zoning. Anything fronted on North Pleasant Street, I've got two large buildings there. There's the professional building, and then there's the Hair by Harlow building, 220. If those buildings were ever to be part of the project, the overall plan, which it very much could and should be, there's no way the numbers would work on a three-story building. I wouldn't ask for five because I already know the answer. So it has to make sense with four. Three, it will not. We just built a three-story building down on Snell Street down there in University Drive. So I know exactly what the costs are and how it would affect things. So just sort of giving you the fundamentals of the decision going into something like this. Um, it, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of risk here. Everybody would agree there's very little risk in renting apartments. It's what you charge for them. And we want to try to keep rents down. However, we need to pay for the bill. We, we do need to pay for the bills. Today, with commercial interest rates at 7% or more, this project is less likely to happen than it was just 12 or 24 months ago. So we as developers take on this interest rate sensitivity risk that two years ago, the numbers are different. Now you go through COVID, costs are 50% more, interest rates are 50% higher. Now, all of a sudden, things just don't make sense. Now, I'm not saying that they don't make sense. I'm just saying they make it's much more difficult to make sense. And those are things that are out of all of our control. So that's the global here. I just I, I go back to saying this is not intended to become some massive student thing that everybody, 
everyone's fearful. I get it. I understand where everybody's coming from. And I kind of feel strongly that the buildings that you all really dislike, you're trying to put all this together to try to keep from something happening. And I'm just kind of telling you, there's got to be a certain amount of flexibility, density, height to even consider something happening. And if the town doesn't put in zoning that accommodates that, we don't have to have a conversation anymore because nothing will happen. But if they do put something together that is workable, then I say, if you want to put in design and stuff like that, sure, that becomes expensive because I'm going to come back to you 10 times because everyone's going to have an opinion. But I'm worth, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to work with design because I want to do something special. But if you're going to take the town zoning and even make it more stringent, you, you may ultimately create a scenario in which nothing happens. That, that's all. I'm, and it's, it's just very simple. I'd love to do something. But the town will speak as far as whether or not we can do it. And we can consider doing this together. I don't I, I think having one person is an advantage than having to deal with a lot of different because you're not going to get a hodgepodge. You're going to get something well thought out, a master plan, and everything will work together instead of two or three different developers doing their own thing. That's just my perspective. Uh, Bruce. Um, I was going to make a motion, which I think would help us get to, to a resolution here, but perhaps uh, we should take Steve first. Okay, Steve? A well, um, couple of things. I just wanted to assure Kurt that the one owner um, characterization is not a position of LHDC. That was in the, the handouts that I provided you that was um, by Pam Rooney and uh, um, Susanna Fabian. Okay, um, fair, fair enough. Sorry about that. You're okay. Right. Yeah. And um, oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, to be honest, Kurt, and we talked about this before. If you didn't do anything, that would be fine too. You know, so that's our. You know, that'd be creating an LHD by default. Um, so the reason why we're discussing this is not because we're an anti-development. What those sketches that. Pam showed you was the build outs and behind, which is what Amherst College has done, um, which I understand it's Amherst College and you know they're not business people. But you know, so we 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 would like our position in the LHD is we're not trying to inhibit uh development, we're just trying to preserve character, uh, which is so essential to this town being destination Amherst and and attracting people, because as we all know. Uh, the town is losing year-round population. And that's a, the last thing I wanted to discuss um, was I wanted to mention to you guys that Kurt and I did discuss Storrs, Connecticut, which is the worst example of a uh, college town. Um, Jennifer and I visited all these different college towns and Storrs by far was the worst. It had high rises with retail on the bottom floor and the, the retail was not open except when students were in town. So as I mentioned to Kurt, it was like, the only thing that was missing from a ghost town was a tumbleweed being blown by by the wind. So um, that's what we need. That's what we need to avoid. There's something else I was going to say, but I can't remember what it was. Um, there's just so much stuff. But okay, I'll leave, yield to back to Bruce. Steve, what was the name of the town? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Oh, Stores, Connecticut. Oh, I'm I'm yes. reminded of what I was going to say. I went to uh, Jennifer and I went to Brown and. Uh, I was an editor of the Brown Daily Herald, so I actually still read it. And there's a very interesting article. Um, the main street for Brown is a street called Thayer Street. And last week they had a 20 year chart of, of commercial development. And basically what it was saying was that every single retail establishment, you know, stuff like clothing, jewelry stores, all have disappeared on Thayer Street because of the internet and big box stores. And the, and the street has become all restaurants. So I just want to let me, which I don't think is such a, you know, personally, I like, you know, I love that good food scene, but I'm just saying that, that that's the wave of the future. Um, so I, whatever that's worth. Okay, not, I think I covered everything. <laughs> Bruce, did you want to make your motion? Well, yes, uh, uh, I would suggest for consideration uh, that because, we are firstly here to decide whether we would want to move forward with a uh, with a district. 
expansion, uh, uh, expansion of the Dickinson uh, Sunset District. I think that's exact. That's that's essentially what we're contemplating. Uh, I think I'm correct. Um, so my motion would be that we hold on the uh, further consideration of expansion of the uh, Hick uh, Dickinson uh, Sunset uh, Historic District until two. Um, the town has completed, uh, and I guess uh, completed means uh, passed into whatever level of uh, um, regulatory uh, power that they will ultimately uh, possess, that we hold until the town has completed the design guidelines that are currently uh, um, about to well they're under they're, they're about to commence the the develop the development process for those and then uh with those guidelines in place um allow the town uh to consider the kind of zoning amendment that would enable the kind of thoughtful redevelopment of the consolidated uh, group of properties between coles lane and Halleck. um i think I think this is an opportunity that uh, um, I'm being, uh, someone's banging on my door. I live in a co-housing community. It's very, very salubrious. I, I can't talk, uh, Irena. I'm, I'm on a Zoom call with the town. Uh, so hold the expansion of the local, uh, uh, of the consideration of the expansion of the district. Uh, until the town has completed uh, the guidelines and that the town has had the opportunity to consider the kind of zoning amendments that would enable a thoughtful redevelopment of the consolidated parcels between Coles Lane and Halleck Street. That's, I guess, essentially the motion. And, I guess the only uh, imagine... question um, about that is, I, I thought it was going to be its own separate, like business, local yeah. historic district, not an expansion. But I might be wrong. Oh, yeah, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. I'm sorry, Pete. I'll wait till I'm recognized. Well, if it is, just Can change it to uh, ch delete the word expansion. Then, uh, basically, I, I it like seems to, to me that we are in a situation. Which, as I said at the beginning, when Steve invited me to reflect on what I'd said in the meeting with Kurt and he and Nate, and uh, was that this is a this is an unusual situation, and as you've heard from Kurt, uh, an unusual opportunity um, opportunity because we've got a developer who is his. I mean, it's so difficult I, uh, to get uh, developers, people who own property in town, to come and talk publicly with uh, planning organisations. I was the uh, foundation chair of the master planning event uh, that began in 1999 and uh, uh, after a few hiccups eventually 15 years later was passed. The the difficulty we had and complete failure we had more or less in, in having uh, uh, property owners engage. So here we have a property owner who's, 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 who's been successful in assembling properties, who's prepared to engage. Number one. Number two, we've got right at the beginning of a process where the town is um, considering design guidelines and 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 we will expect will be they will be effectively produced and number three the location of this is in that um, rather tortured space um, uh, which you know used to be residential and over time has not become so so it's a it seems to me that because of those three uh, uh, conditions, we really should uh, um, uh, um, see if, uh, if if boldness will not uh, reward us with uh, a good solution. Okay, so we have a motion uh, to hold on the decision to create a new LHD to include parts of downtown until the town has completed its design guidelines and then consider guidelines for thoughtful development of this area. We need a second, and then we can have some discussion of this motion. Do I have a second? There's no second to the motion. Okay, it's dead. It's dead. All right, Steve, you have something to say. Yeah, I, I don't, well, I don't know if we need a motion or not to, to do this, but I would just amend Bruce's, I think we should act in good faith 
and look at this as an opportunity um, you know, for development, because once again, we're not about, we're not anti-development, we're pro-preservation and pro-character. So how about if we did what Bruce's motion was and just made it a shorter period of time, like six months or a year? So I would say, you know, I'd like to have a motion um, to table further uh, discussion of the downtown uh, business uh, historical uh, commission uh, for let's say a year uh, to see if the town can really come up with what they you know uh, architectural guidelines which are binding so we're acting in good faith and let's see what the town does you know um, so that's that's okay I'll, I'll second that Karen, yes. okay. uh, did you have something to say? I, I don't want to interrupt that because I, I like that and, and I, I would go along with that. I just want to take this opportunity while Kurt is uh, with us to say, is there any way with all your property you can figure out how to get a nice, wonderful little grocery store in there? <laughs> I would bend a lot of... Uh, limits to get that as everybody is dying to be able to walk downtown and buy some nice cheese and things like that and not go to Cumberland. So I just wanted to take that opportunity. I, I second that motion. <laughs> well, well, uh, that's up. So, so, <laughs> well, when you say nice little grocery store, you know, you do realize when you go to a grocery store, you understand there's a lot of black top out there to park on, right? So, if you're talking something comparable to a Cumberland's, that to me is not a grocery store. But um, it, it, sure, I'm not going to discount any a grocery store like Big Y. I mean, you need parking, right? No one's going to. That, that's why they exist like that. Um, I'm not going to sit here and predetermine what will and won't want to go into these spaces. There's going to be plenty of opportunity to fit a store like that in to one, two, or three different buildings. Um, if there's an operator that can come in and operate successfully, I would agree with you. I think it would be great. Is, is there, uh, Karen, did you have something else to say? You had your hand up. No, Karen, you're, you're muted. Sorry, I'm, I'm thinking of stores like in Manhattan where you walk in and I would say no parking and no asphalt, just enough to be delivered you know, living in, in Europe, there's so many great grocery stores that are not big white. Like I'm not, yeah. Anyway. yeah. Okay. So I, again, you bring a good tenant that can operate and do something like that. Bakeries, flower shops, all that stuff. Coffee shops. I love all that stuff. I think we all love the same thing. We just need to have somebody to be able to come in and operate and be able to pay, you know, I, I, I dare say market rent, a fair rent um to be able to to survive it's it's uh our economy i speak to so many people about our economy now and i, I just reference it now it's just a mess i don't know how else to describe it trying to find workers trying to survive get these small businesses to survive it's just a mess and we need to come through this um and what how we come out the other end i don't think we know yet and that's one of the reasons why you have to be a little careful about saying no to a lot of things that when i talk to nate and others um whatever requirements you put down give yourself the opportunity to say yes because it, it doesn't have to be by right i i'm not suggesting that at all because i understand all the feelings and i agree with all that but we don't know what this is going to look like when we come out the other end we're not even close it's we've got years before we really figure out to see how this is going to sh shake out with remote working with amazons of the world with you know what's in our future drone deliveries yep what we all want myself included is to walk downtown and have a, an atmosphere there so that's what i'm trying to create is an atmosphere there in order to make that happen however there are some things that we may ultimately not prefer and that is a lot of high density apartments there's just no other way to make it happen we don't have that kind of a vibrant downtown retail business situation it's a reality that we live with and that's that's what's going to make it happen uh, Steve? Yeah, I'm sorry to keep <laughs> raising my hand. 
Nate, we haven't heard from you for a long time. Um, can the town, you know, make this a priority to do design guidelines? Can we talk to Paul? Or can you? I mean, it seems like we're meeting. You know, we all want the same thing. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. No. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. No. It's been. You know, the planning department's been a bit short staffed, but it is a priority. The planning uh, board has looked at uh, the request for proposal a few times, and so we have a document that's. You know, we're actually hoping to get out um, next month to get a consultant on board. So it is something that you know, I you know, I wish it was already ongoing. So it is a priority for the town. I, I um, you know, as the planning board has discussed updating the preservation plan, and you know, they talked about East Amherst. It made me realize that you know, design guidelines and standards are really important. So you know, we were the planning board has talked about rezoning along College Street and East Amherst, and you know, Bruce said, oh, it'd be great to have some kind of gateway development, right? As opposed to say what, you know, somehow when you come into Amherst sometimes you're like, okay, when do you arrive in Amherst? It's nice to have something. And, you know, that may not happen without design standards. And so I think that it is a really important piece. Um, if we were to allow, say, redevelopment of certain areas, I like design standards to accompany rezoning. So I agree that I think before zoning changes, we would love to have these standards in place. But Nate, would these design standards be unique for the down the strip that we're talking about or uh, for the entire town? Yeah, so the way it's written right now is that um uh you know, first there would be like a there's like a you know five step process. One is kind of public outreach and visioning and determining kind of what are the boundaries of the study area for the design standards. And staff has really thought about their, you know, kind of like three levels of standards. One is the core downtown, say like along North Pleasant, South Pleasant. Main, right? And it becomes there's maybe a, a standards for this, um, it's like main commercial retail area. And then there could be standards for transitional zones and then standards for residential areas near, you know, near downtown. And so, although the, the consultant is only looking at downtown, my hope is that, say, the design standards of these transitional zones could become what's appropriate in other village centers. And so, you know, we wouldn't, they're not looking at it, but if we already have a lot of work done, staff could take those and modify them and then apply them to the village centers without having to go through a whole process all over again, right? Because we would have had a lot of work done. So that, I mean, that's my, that's the way it's been um, crafted. And the planning board kind of talked about that too, is having kind of enough enough in the standards that it, you know, you could adapt it in the, to other parts of the town um, without having to, you know, hire a consultant all over again. So I, I you know, we're, writing it that way and we're hoping we get that product. Uh, okay, so we have a motion to table the further discussion of the downtown LHD for a year to see if the town develops architectural guidelines that are binding. Um, is there more discussion before we move to a vote? Can I ask, um, I wanna ask a question about the timing. Okay. So you feel that it would be a year before those are completed? The design guidelines? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good assessment. Nicole? Can I, can I, wait a minute, can I ask one other question? So the consultant um, presents these or drafts them up and then what's the group that approves them? And does this commission or the historical commission also weigh in on those guidelines? Good question. Yeah, so there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of processy, you know, like steps in the process where different boards and committees will weigh in. And so, um, you know, I think there's going to be stakeholder meetings up front that involve, you know, anywhere from boards, committees to residents, property owners, staff, and then along the process, along the way, they'll be reviewed by different boards and committees. Um, you know, in terms of how they're adopted, um, you know, the planning board would have to adopt them and maybe town council. Um, so it depends on, you know, some of the things might be standards for the right of way so that, you know, the town council uh, has jurisdiction over the right of way and then if it's going into zoning then it's the planning board um would it could adopt them or then it could go back to town council so you know it's you know that's some of it is why it, there could be a process so you know the consultant you know there's like i said there's going to be some outreach some research surveys a lot of time going back and forth with input and then there has to be this adoption um, of them so you know my thought is that they're not actually incorporated into the zoning bylaw, they're referenced in the zoning bylaw. So once the standards are done, 
we insert them into the bylaw in certain sections saying, you know, when reviewing projects, these standards shall apply. And then the standards are already developed and hopefully then it's an easy adoption to the zoning. So then that is a, a council adoption, but you know, the work is the consultant is doing the design guidelines, not then the staff or the planning board coming up with them. They, they would actually give us a finished product that could be adopted. Um, one more question about what is exactly, exactly is in the guidelines. Is it height? Is it setback? Is it um, architectural detail? All of the above? All of the above. All of the above. And so, um, um, you know, uh, for instance, like um, in Ithaca, New York, they have some, um, you know, they, you know, there's a, there's a bunch, but yeah, it would be, um, all of that. So setbacks, height, you know, uh, it could be computer generated or hand drawn, you know, illustrations with, you know, a lot of text annotation saying, you know, here's the type of kind of architectural we detail we'd want separating first floor if it's retail from upper floor commercial, you know, is it a type of banding or material change? Um, you know, maybe um, fenestration patterns, you know, glazing percentage of proportions to non glazing, you know, I mean, just you know, a lot of things that could help uh, give the planning board, um, you know, you know, guidelines when when reviewing buildings. And so right now, for instance, zoning has a range of setbacks or might just say 10 feet or zero feet, but it doesn't relate to how the that building property line interacts with the street or the length, you know, width of a sidewalk or distance to curb. And so these would get into that. So, you know, in, you know, Ideally, we'd have say we'd have 15 foot sidewalks all over downtown or something, right? That's what if the consultant says that, then I'm hoping that becomes how the planning board would review projects. If someone is coming and they only have, they can meet that setback, that 15 foot setback with five feet on their property, then it's five feet. If another property is needs seven feet, then it's seven feet. And so, yeah. Okay, thanks. Are we ready to vote? I guess I, I have another question just to clarify. Um, with the design standards and guidelines and the purpose of this commission with preserving the historic buildings, I'm wondering if those guidelines are actually going to be addressing, like to me, they don't seem that they're actually going to address the existing historic preservation of a building. No, or <laughs> like they're definitely giving guidelines as to building new and what we're doing with, or maybe, maybe not demolition, but I'm just not certain that we, they do still like I, I agree waiting to see what happens um with the guidelines in downtown because I feel like that is going to help frame everything but I'm not quite sure if the downtown guidelines actually are going to be working towards preserving the historic buildings or if I'm missing something. Frida? Oh, I just want, I think that's a really good question. And I just have a question for Steve. Steve, you mentioned six months and a year. And I wondered, and then we jumped from the six month to a year. I wondered if you had a preference of those two times or if oh. six months would be a good, a better time to check in. Yeah, no, I don't, I, I would just thought the year was more reasonable. But to get back to Nicole's question, Nicole, uh, I mean, we have to count on, um, the guidelines to be contextual and to look historic with the, you know, with the surrounding buildings. But to be honest, we cannot, uh, unless you have a local historic district, we those buildings will be coming down if they do development. That's really the major issue. With with a local historic district, we can, per, you know, it can prevent those historic buildings. Those well, uh, nine of them are historic, uh, not including the bag, uh, the bagel place. And they are historic. I mean, Susanna Fabing has done, who is the head of, you know, Smith College Museum, has done an extensive job. They're historic in terms of our town. Um, so the real issue here is if we don't have a historic district, uh, their local historic district, those buildings will eventually come down. The question is, can we do something uh, to make it that what comes in their place is contextual? Um, and user-friendly for the town. 
so that's really actually what this whole issue is about. But your, your, your question is really great because, and Nate, I hope you can answer this, what in your standards, are they going to be historical? You know, uh, in terms of the existing character of the town? Well, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, I was gonna respond the way you said, Steve, about mm -hmm. them being contextual. So it's not as if they're gonna say, you know, the hair by Harlow building that, you know, if you renovate it, this is the window grill pattern you're going to use. It's, it's yeah. not, it's not going to be, you know, like that prescriptive of, you know, per, a preservation design standard. Um, but it will have um, illustrations and other things that could help if they were going to, you know, say redevelop that building or renovate that building. That would also, that it would, so the idea is that the standards could apply for a renovation project or new construction. So it's not going to be something that um, can only be used for new construction, but it's not going to be, in, in my mind, um, you know, sometimes local historic districts have guidelines that are really prescriptive and, you know, to the point of, you know, like four inch clapboard siding, um, you know, a 12 over 12. And that's not what I'm envisioning for these standards. It, you know, it may for the residential, right? So I, I'm thinking that it might have some recommendations um, in terms of say window sizes or um, general appearance, but I'm not sure it's going to get down to every detail like that. Um, I'm sorry to once again talk so much. You know, an example of contextual development um, that I actually was fine with is in South Hadley. You know that big complex where the movie theater is and the bookstore, the Odyssey bookstore? Are you guys familiar with that? Well, actually, it turns out I know somebody that works as a professor at Holy, Mount Holyoke, and that property is owned by Mount Holyoke. And Mount Holyoke made an you know, enlightened decision, which I wish Amherst College would do, uh, to like try to make the town more attractive. They finance and design that development. And I'm fine with that development. You know, uh, it kind of looks colonial. Um, you know, so would you guys, that's the kind of thing that I'm like seeing in my future, you know, uh, that's what I see as contextual. So I just wanted to bring, Point that out. Chris? Uh, I have to go in about uh, four minutes. Um, so uh, I'm just alerting to that. And I, I will be a positive vote on the motion unless it's uh, amended in some way. Uh, Craig? Yeah, hi. Last comment. I agree with you, Steve. I think that that project over there in South Hadley is terrific. And that's exactly what I would envision, something of that type of look in, in, in the area. Um, I've expressed to Nate that if you want to have a three or four floor limit to allow exceeding the height so you can put peaks and things in and not have flat roofs. So I completely agree that that is exactly, if I had to point to one project, that would represent what I'm trying to accomplish there. That's a really good example. And I'll kind of leave it with you that not, not the ones you're fearful of. That's what I envision. Are we ready to vote then? Okay, uh, Nicole? Um, yep, in favor of halting. Liz? Elizabeth? Yes, I'm in favor. Uh, Karin? Yes. Uh, Steve? Yes. Bruce? Yep. And Greta? Yes. And I am too. Okay, so we're going to table uh, further discussion uh, for a year to see if the town develops architectural guidelines, binding architectural guidelines, uh, and we'll come back to it at that point. Uh, do you want at this point to return to the discussion of East Amherst or shall we wait with that as we, we are supposed to also discuss Amherst Media's request for a 90 day extension? I would sorry, just I, you know, um, I would say let's go to Amherst Media's just it is time sensitive. Um, and, you know, I think uh, East Amherst, we could try to schedule another site visit. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Uh, is Oops. there somebody from Let's Amherst Media who's here to uh, discuss this? Yep, Jim. Uh, Jim here. Uh, Let's go. The executive director is here. Jim, you you can unmute yourself. You um, can I just say something? Uh, it occurs. Oh no, Greta's uh, 
uh, and Karen are here from uh, the. So I'm I'm not the only member of this commission who was uh, party to the uh, consideration of Amos Media. So I think I can go without uh, being a problem here. Sorry, just a rumination. I'm good, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Would you like me to speak? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. please do. This is Jim Lesko. I'm the executive director of Amherst Media, and I appreciate you taking this issue up on uh, such short notice. Uh, as you probably see, we're asking for a 90-day extension. Um, there's for obvious reasons, one being that uh, as soon as we had this uh, wonderful certificate of appropriateness back signed in February 22nd of uh, 2020, you all know what happened. We went into COVID. We went into all sorts of spirals. And we also lost our architect. The Gillen Associates retired. So we didn't have a final set of plans and we were stuck for quite a while. We now have an architect. We have Tristan Metcalf of Metcalf Associates out of Northampton. Our uh, full set of plans are coming forward with a construction uh, uh, proposal. And we're just asking for your uh, kindness to let us move a little forward. We have a meeting with the planning board on, I believe, June 7th. Uh, and we're looking forward for that to make sure that we bring up uh, what we're planning to do uh, and uh, meeting all the requirements that were put forth by this, uh, this body. Thank you, Tim. Uh, comments from the commission? I think we, sh I would support giving them more time. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Anyone else have anything they'd like to say? Karen? I also support it, uh, definitely. Frida? I support it, although I still, there's, a, in deep in my heart, I hope if Amherst Media decides not to build, it becomes parkland for the town, green land for the town. So I don't know that that's a possibility, but if Amherst Media at some point decides it's a no-go on their building, I'd like so, to go back to town land. So I think if, um, you know, it looks like there's someone in the audience has their hand raised, but if the commission wanted to agree to the extension, I'd want a, um, a motion and a vote, and then I would write just a, um, like a meeting summary that would be recorded with the town clerk and then, you know, go on record. And then it's a, there's a 90 day extension. Uh, do we have a motion to approve this 90 day extension? I motion. I second. Uh, then I think we're ready to vote. Um, so uh, Steve. Uh, yes. Nicole. Yes. Rita? Yes. Karen? Yes. Uh, Elizabeth? Yes. And I also approve it. So uh, Jim, you've gotten approval of the 90 day sure. extension for your certificate of appropriateness for the main and Gray Street property. Thank you all. I appreciate it very much and look forward to coming before you very soon. And then it looks like, Tris, you still have your hand raised. Um, you can speak if you'd like. I, I didn't see any controls and so, yeah, I did raise my hand. Now I was just gonna add real quick that um, the approved plans are gonna be identical. The, the the building permit plans will be identical with what's approved. Nothing mm -hmm. is changing. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, do we have any unanticipated items for today? No. Uh, do we have any public comment? Uh, then I think we're ready to talk about next meeting dates. We need a, a date to for to continue our uh, inspection of the East Amherst Historic District. And um, do we have do you know of other businesses that's going to come before the commission that we need? Yeah, actually, there's. Um, I think I said at the site visit, there's a few applications that need to will need to be um, reviewed at a public hearing. They're um, 
they're you know they're minor projects um you know like uh, compressors uh some lighting but things that will need a hearing and so you know if, if they're submitted next week um you know with the notice i mean it looks like probably like the last week in june is what um when we would need a hearing I'm, i may or may not be around then <laughs> um so then it would be like the first week in July. I mean, you know, some of it is when, you know, trying to guess on when they would submit to, but I think it's, they haven't yet. So when we have 45 days, so I think we're okay. So I don't know if we need to, you know, if we want to schedule a meeting in mid June, just to have one, and then we'd have one in early July as a hearing to review these projects, if that makes sense. Okay. So mid June would put us at um, like June 12th or June 13th, the week of June 12th. I won't be here, but. I can do either, so. The day of the 12th is difficult um, for me. Uh, I don't know if we, if, if Greta is also not there, if the 19th, like the following week, if it's not pressing. I'm I'm out of town till the end of the month from the ninth. So I mean we could try June thirteenth and then maybe like the week before we could have another site visit to East Amherst if that works for people. Okay. The commissioners. And Nicole, is the thirteenth better for you or is it um yes, the thirteenth will be fine. I'm not available the week prior. Mm -hmm. All right. And and what time would of day would you do this? The site visit. I mean, I thought 10 a.m. worked pretty well for. Is that still the case for most people? For most of them, um, we could do like. I don't 9. think I. I can't make it till 10:30 probably. Okay. Uh, wait. So for the site visit, are we talking about the 13th, or are we talking about the week before then? I was thinking June 13th would be a meeting. Okay. Oh, yeah. a meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be so, Yep, and, and would you do that at three o'clock, Nate? Or if that works for the for the commission, okay. I would. Yeah. Okay. June thirteenth at three. Okay. And then for another site visit, it could be some day, you know, the week before. And we could. Oh, I see. Uh, do you want to aim for that Monday morning? Does that work, uh, Nicole? Are you, are Monday mornings okay for you? Um, that week prior, I'm not available. Not at all. Okay. Um, we could try like June 6th is the Tuesday a week before at 10 a.m. Is that he's not here that week? Nicole's not available, yeah. It's all right, you can still do it. Tweet, are you around then? Let me know. I'm around the 6th, yeah. I'm I also around, would the last week in May work for Nic for everybody? Not for Nicole, nope, not either. <laughs> Sorry. We want to have that nice, good weather too, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the six, the, the six, six would work for me. And, and uh, 10 o'clock in the morning again. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, where would you like to meet? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, it seems like we didn't get east or west very much in uh, on the site visit. So, you know, starting there, I just I'm trying to look at a map to see where's parking. And so, I mean, I guess we we could, I mean, could park on Spalding and walk walk from there, perhaps. Yeah, so we could park on right Spalding, or I don't know if Shumway has parking, and then meet, you know, meet in front of. Um, you know, the Ithmar Conkey house in front of Salem place at 10 could be the meeting place. I think it would be helpful to have the historic maps ahead and, and to bring mm -hmm. with us mm -hmm. so we know what we're what we're looking at, you know, what was there. Mm -hmm. So we get that broader sense. Nate, where did you say you wanted to meet? Oh, in front of, um, you know, the Salem place, the condominiums with th that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
So June 6th at 10 o'clock or is that 10.30? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I can, I'll just keep uploading things to online. So there's a, you know, web page that I started and I can put some maps and, and I'll see if I can, you know, the inventory forms are on Mac, macros maps, but I'll see if I can export them in a way that it's easy to, mm -hmm. um, to get them in a file. Yeah. Are you going to label that file East Amherst um, or is it just going to be in our general file? And it's, I, it's actually through the commission's web page. So there's a whole other web page that says East Amherst. I could not find the stuff yesterday, but I wish we could do Dropbox again. We can't do that. Grant said we couldn't do it. So much. Uh, they, um, I think the they they like this better, where it's just um, available to the like public. Mm -hmm. So much. Better. Yeah. Okay. You don't believe in Google Drives, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that, well, you know, that becomes, it could be a violation of open meeting law if there's mm -hmm. document sharing or things happening with, you know, comments and not, that's available to the public. So the preference is, you know, we put, I'm putting it online, everyone can see it, it's public, so there's no, there's no okay. risk there. Yeah. If you okay. can just provide us with a direct link. Yep. That. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, the document, having the documents ahead is really helpful. So mm -hmm. appreciated that this last time. So. Karen, we can't hear you. I can't anyway. No, please. Karen, did you have to say that again? No, uh, we're not. No, you're unmuted, but we still can't hear you. I don't know if it's uh, audio connection or. <laughs> it's a long meeting. <laughs> Elizabeth, I wanted to tell you, I'm reading, I'm halfway through your book. It's amazing. I was reading the Ben Franklin biography that won the Pulitzer, and I'm. Um, your book, I'm riveted by it. I just can't, I, it make a great movie. So, yeah, I um, I wanted Jack Nicholson to play the <laughs> mill owner. No, that action sequence when the dam breaks, how did you document step-by-step step everything that happened? Yeah. Uh, and what, are, how do, I'm sorry to monopolize the committee's time, but what are, how do they have brass works in Haydenville and Williamsburg? Did they mine? Mm -hmm copper or how do they no they imported that but like in new central new england this is yeah. kind of um you know metal valley just think of what goes on in greenfield and turner's falls and oh. down into connecticut it's sort yeah. of that little, little channel where they were doing a lot of metal working you know fine working and making the patterns and the pieces it's wow. really inventive anyway, it's, work it's, yeah. awesome. it's and so well written and oh, anyway, thanks yeah. Um, a labor of so love. Lucky that we got you on this committee. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> we are it's very fun. pleased to have you on this committee. Thank this you. Someone, what a great really group. I'm knowledge. enjoying it. Yeah. Thank uh, you. All right. Well, I think we are ready to adjourn the meeting. Uh, everybody. So who? Who? who uh, let's see, I'll, I'll take roll call to be in favor. Greta. Um, yes. Uh, Nicole. Yes. Steve. Yes. Karen. Yes. You're back on, we can hear you, Elizabeth. Yes. And I too agree. Uh, thank you, Nate, for organizing the agenda and for the materials. And uh, we will see you on June 6th. All right, thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.